I wanted to welcome our uh, guests also from WSU and uh, KU Med Center, and we just had a wonderful panel earlier today. Uh, Dr. Carol Baldwin uh, facilitated that uh, with uh, Dr. Lou Medine and Dr. Raj Wengri. Uh, I am just here to welcome you, and uh, uh, not to do the introductions, but I will just introduce the introducer. And that's uh, Chuck Clark is going to introduce Dr. Landry, the only part of the introduction that I forgot this morning when I introduced you is I was quoted as saying, and I probably said this because I love basketball, that, that you're the Steph Curry of successful aging. So I don't know uh, where that came from, but that got, it, it got its upon its way in print. <laughs> so uh, we're excited uh, to have uh, all of you here, and I want to say a special thanks to, to uh, Trina Ian and uh, Tammy Flamming and uh, Meg and Amy Hall and uh, help me out here, all of those, pardon? Carlene. Carlene Williams and uh, just so many of you who helped put this together. And then I want to reiterate and double back and say Dr. Lumembe, thanks so much for uh, your getting involved at this level with us and pulling this together. So uh, Chuck Clark, resident, is going to introduce uh, Dr. Lumembe. I don't want to forget Jeremy either. He worked hard on this. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker, Dr. Roger Landry. Known as Dr. Roger to some of us. He received his uh, MD degree from Tufts University School of Medicine and then uh, received a Master of Public Health degree from a small unknown university called Harvard. <laughs> he was a flight surgeon with the U.S. Air Force for more than 22 years and retired as a highly decorated full colonel in the Flight Surgeon Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, he's been involved in many significant activities over the years, and I'll just I'll mention a couple seven space launches and one of the probably worst ones is Chernobyl and look at some of the problems that occurred during that period. <coughs> Following his work in the Air Force, he and his brother uh, decided to start Masterpiece Living. Their goal was to apply practical research, apply research in a practical way and the research came from a 10 year, $10 million study. And we have a few books on, on the, uh, uh, outside the auditorium here that are for free if you want to take one. This is the results of the study. Uh, it's, it's really not a difficult read, it's, it's pretty interesting. It was one of the early attempts at putting science and uh, aging together. Uh, he and his brother, after starting Masterpiece, have tried to move this technology to the CRCs like Larksfield. Now Larksfield had some involvement in the same type of work early on, as you know. Uh, he wrote a book which uh, also is available in the uh, business center. If you don't have a copy, uh, I think they're $8 or uh, discounted. And uh, we have a few. We don't have a lot of them, but we have a few. Uh, Roger is acclaimed worldwide as a speaker and he's won many awards. Uh, He's on numerous boards focused on aging and longevity. He also has his own podcast. I hope his comments have a great impact on you all as they have on Joe and I. So would you please give a warm welcome from Marshfield and Wichita?
coming. Hello, everybody. Uh, boy, I, you know, I've heard a lot of nice things about Kansas. I've been to Kansas before about, you know, how is the people? And wow, you have not proven it wrong. Mike, thank you very much for the invitation. Chuck, for all the things we've done together over the years, thank you very much. Joan. Uh, and, but mostly thank all of you for coming today. Uh, I think you take this thing, uh, Healthy Longevity, seriously. Yeah, I hope so. Well, I hope so. And what we're going to be talking about, this is, this, this lighthouse is in my town, my hometown of Falmouth, Massachusetts, in Cape Cod. And, uh, and I like, I love the whole metaphor uh, and analogies of the lighthouse. But a game plan for healthy longevity. I realize that in many respects I'm bringing beer to Bavaria here. Uh, many of you are, know a lot about this uh, from the uni local university, from your staff, and, uh, and many of you who, uh, who have been looking into this and, and heading in the right direction for healthy longevity. So with you, even if it's just validating what you're doing, that's enough. Uh, but I'm hoping that many of you will leave here, and it's my goal, you leave here empowered, feeling empowered and optimistic about the, this next phase of your life, because you should be. And it's my job today, uh, somewhat of an evangelist, an evangelist about healthy longevity. So here we go. This, unfortunately, is the, the path of most lives still in this country. We're born, we uh, Develop to our very best. We go a few decades with all cylinders going. Everything's wonderful. And then the stuff starts to happen, right? You get a little pain here. And you may get some sort of, uh, you know, run in with uh, some heart disease or even some cancer. And uh, it, it tends to just chip away at us. Now, luckily, and you know this, we're living longer. Uh, we are blessed with uh, longevity that our grandparents didn't have. But there's no guarantee that that longevity is of high quality. And so you can very much see, as in this particular graph, that this person, half their lives, they're struggling with some sort of impairment, some sort of thing that is probably costly, painful. And you know, it's, uh, you, know you wonder about longevity. People say, I don't want to live to be 100, because they assume this is the path. There's got to be a better way. And, and there is. I wouldn't be here today, you wouldn't be here either, unless there was a better way. The dotted line here represents the concept and, and the reality of someone being able to stay at high levels of function, even if it's not that high. But the, the point is they stay at very high levels rather than the continual decline. And then when life throws them a curveball, that little dip, they're able to bounce back. It's resilience in action. And this is called, uh, you know, it's called healthy longevity, but in public health terms, we call this the compression of morbidity. Morbidity is when we're sick and impaired, and we want to compress that time, right? And so that we live our lives being as functional, as high quality of life as possible, and then when our time comes, it's fairly quick. I think that's a noble goal. I know I want it. And so this is, this is called healthy longevity. You know, Ashley Montague gave, gave us great advice. He's a writer. He said, die young, as late as possible. <laughs> there you go. So, is this possible? Well, as late as uh, the early 80s, the MacArthur Foundation down in Chicago, or up in Chicago, uh, uh, started a study. It was a 10-year-long study on aging. That's outlined in that book, Successful Aging, that they just showed you that was out there. And they demonstrated for the first time that the most significant thing determining what our life's graph is was our lifestyle. The choices that we make every day. And it was never too late, and it was never too early to begin. So that the choices we made determined up to 70% of that, 70% for physical and 50% for mental, was, was determined whether we took that dotted line or the solid line was the choices that we made. And not, again, not only when we were young, it's, it's over our whole lifespan, the choices we make determine that. Now, that was big news at the time. It still is pretty big news, but I think it's a little more well known. So they told us that, again, it was up to us. Now, there's more. 
How many of you heard of the Blue Zones? The Blue Zones are these five areas, the original ones, uh, that um, where Dan Buechner, he's a writer for National Geographic and a researcher, uh, wanted to find out where in the world do people live to be very old and yet are very vital. 90s and 100s and still engaged, still productive. You know, where, where are these places? And he found five. He called them the Blue Zones. And he, then he began to study what is it about these people? What is their lifestyle? Because he knows that lifestyle is a major determinant. So what is that lifestyle that would result in those sort of things? And here were the big things. First of all, these people moved. They moved. Movement was their life. Now, when we were younger, uh, it always was. We're moving and tapping your leg if, if you're not actually walking around or running or whatever. But in, as we get older, we tend to get more sedentary. Right now, uh, just about half our population is sedentary. A new paper, well, three years now, from Mayo Clinic was entitled, Sitting is the New Smoking. <laughs> and he did the work. He did the research. The data was there that sitting and being, having a sedentary lifestyle as defined by the Surgeon General was the equivalent of a half pack of cigarettes a day smoking for your life. And so that's when the first time when we began to see, well, you know, maybe what my grandmother did. She turned 60, got out the rocking chair and said, do me. I've earned it. You know, and she did, you know, all that. But to the extent that we stopped moving, it, it becomes a serious problem because we are creatures of movement. We're meant to move. Now, we're not talking running marathons here. We're not talking, talking heroics. We're talking about just moving because we don't. Those of you who count your steps, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult sometimes to get up to 10,000 steps. But the hunter-gatherers, who are our ancestors and who well, our species, for 99% of the time we've been on Earth, we were hunter-gatherers. 99% of the time, hunter-gatherers. Now, there's still some hunter-gatherer tribes around, and they'll take up to 21,000 steps a day. They move. And these people also move. There aren't gyms here in most of these. Yeah. Oh, I have to deal with the surprise, too. Did you notice that uh, one of them, go back, See that one way over on the, on the left? Loma Linda, California. What's that about? The others you maybe get, they're islands and, you know, and kind of isolated. But Loma Linda, that's Southern California. They're nuts in Southern California. <laughs> well, what happened there is there's a large contingent of Seventh-day Adventists who live in Loma Linda. And their lifestyle is one very similar to all the others there. So they're sort of like a, a little island amongst themselves. So again, what we found is that these were the characteristics, strong social connection. I'm going to talk about each one of these. This is for, for a lifetime. There was, uh, our, our ancestors didn't have uh, any reason. We, to, we wouldn't have survived, actually. Our, our species wouldn't have survived had not our ancestors bonded together and became a group. I don't even think they had a sense, I wasn't there, but that they had a sense of individuality. It was being part of a whole. And it was because of that we were able to survive, and that's why we made it as a species. And we have inherent in us, in our very DNA, to be connected to others. So all of you who live here, great decision. And take it full advantage of it. Because in our society, we become more and more isolated. You see it with your friends, you maybe saw it happening to you, and then made this decision, and uh, it's deadly. Uh, we do not do well when we are not socially connected. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Slower pace of life. Is this, uh, you know, our ancestors had no clocks. There was no such thing as time. It was sunrise, sunset, the seasons, the, the moon. You didn't rush around like crazy people like we do today in our frenetic society, causing a lot of uh, damage to us. Uh, so it was a slower pace. Mediterranean diet was the basis of what we've eaten as a species for most, most of the time we've been on Earth. They didn't call it that, of course. It was fruits, nuts, vegetables, wild grains, and small amounts of meat. They were hunter-gatherers, doctor. What do you mean, small amounts of meat? Well, they weren't that good at hunting for a long time. <laughs> and 
was only when we domesticated animals that we were able to have access to a lot of meat. But that was the diet that we've eaten, and so it should be no surprise that that's what we function best on from a nutritional standpoint. Everyone had a role. Excuse me. Everyone had a role. Older adults, young children, all part of a group, all had a role. So no one was marginalized, no one was left to the side, no one, in fact, elders, you see down below, in these cultures and in our previous ones, hunter-gatherer elders were cultural treasures. All right, how many of you feel like a cultural treasure? <laughs> you know, with your families, I hope you do, but in, in our society, it's not the way we handle aging. And we're, we're going to make that better. You folks are making it better. What's going on here? What's going on in Wichita State and around the country and around the world? We're starting to learn things that we should not have forgotten. But since the Industrial Revolution, we did forget them. Before that, elders were an essential part of every community, guiding it, the knowledge, the wisdom. I mean, who? It's like saving a whole bunch of gold your life. And when you get a big pile of it, you just push it off to the side and don't use it. That's really what it's about. I mean, who would say, you know, older adults are, are survivors. They obviously have resilience to make it where they did. They have wisdom. You know, they don't have it all right. And it's not all the answers, but they're an essential part of society. And that's why our panel this morning was so exhilarating for me to, to, to see what's going on here in this area, here, and you know, with Wichita State and around Wichita uh, for uh, intergenerational mixing and programming and doing things together. And we were, we were very close to nature. Nature wasn't a place we visited. You know, we visit nature and feel good about it. We were nature. It, it was us. We were part of it. it we are inherent. And, you know, we share so many things. You know, the same compounds that make us up. And we were talking about this today. Uh, Mike asked me, he said, you have some friends who are astronauts and that sort of thing. He said, what do they say when they come back? It was a great question. And I remembered a friend of mine said when he went up there and he looked down at the earth, he was forever changed. Because to look down there at this little ball in this vast space and realize what goes on there, all the good and all the bad, and he said he, he just, everything else became petty for him after that. Here we are sharing uh, the same compounds, the same history, the same future, whatever that is. And, uh, and this is how it is in these, uh, these blue zones, and it, and it reflects what we have been for most of the time we have been on Earth with our hunter-gatherer backgrounds. All right, more evidence. Does lifestyle affect how we age? This lady won a Nobel Prize. She's at the Salk Institute now with her study on telomeres. Anyone hear telomeres? Telomeres are the very ends of our DNA strands. And when they're long, that means the, the cell has long to live, long time, and the organ that it's in, and the organism that it's all in. Well, she studied these, these uh, the telomeres, and the length of the telomeres, they get shorter as the cell gets older, is about to die. The telomeres are real short. They protect the DNA during cell division. And she found that when someone lived a life of high activity, uh, good nutrition, uh, well, all the things we're going to be talking about, uh, those telomeres stayed longer, longer. There was evidence. All right, those of you who are skeptics, that's not enough. And lifestyle change how we age. It's a whole new field of epigenetics. That basically is there. Our choices can affect our genes. Yes. <laughs> I'm starting to sound like the late Kenny Rogers here. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, what this is, is that we now can map the human genome. If you spit in a glass, we can map all of your DNA. We can look at your genes. Oh, good one, good one. Oh, there's a bad one. That one it results in some bad diseases. So we study people with that gene, and we look at their lifestyle. Those who live a lifestyle that we're going to be talking about, high physical activity, not high, movement. Physical activity, intellectual stimulation and learning, socially connected and living with meaning and purpose. You know what happens? That gene 
and a good many people just sits there and never expresses itself. So we spit the bad gene, and it just lays there, and nothing happens. Whereas someone who does not live that lifestyle, it is more likely to express itself. This is amazing stuff. Your lifestyle affects how your genes can be. And we're learning more and more about this since we mapped the human genome. So, here we go. Lifestyle builds resilience. Lifestyle is more likely to result in a healthy longevity, live long, die short, you know, living, dying young and ahead as late as possible, because life does throw you curveballs, right? Does anyone doubt that? It, it will, and it will continue, and as we get older, they, the, the, the curveballs are fast, all it's tough. It's a tough environment. And so the ability to bounce back when life throws you a curveball is related to your lifestyle. All right, so that's why the MacArthur Foundation found out what they did. What we also know is that we tend to reflect the values of our peers, like those who hang around with smokers tend to smoke, those who hang around with violent, uh, a tendency towards violence, get a tendency towards violence, especially when we're younger. Um, obesity <laughs> tends to be together. Again, we reflect the values of our peers. So, where you live matters because how you live matters. We just established that lifestyle is the major determinant. And when you live with people who are physically active, intellectually active, who are socially connected and you are with them, and who, who stimulate you to have meaning and purpose in your life, this is an environment that makes all the difference. So congratulations, all of you. Pat yourself on the back, those of you who, uh, who live here. So. What I'm going to attempt to do, and again, I know I'm bringing beer to Bavaria here, but to give you 10 tips that reflect some of the lifestyle choices you may be thinking about and um, that are associated, and the research is very clear on this. Since MacArthur Foundation, which came out in the 90s, all subsequent research has, has basically validated their findings, how important your lifestyle choices are, and that it's never too late. But before we go into these 10 tips, I want to talk about how we approach change in our lives. How many of you have made a New Year's resolution that you're still doing? <laughs> One. Congratulations. What's that? I'll never make New Year's resolutions again. Yeah. <laughs> but that's about the level I see. That's the kind of success we have. What's going on with that, right? We're motivated to do better to live healthier lives or to do whatever we make a resolution to do. And why doesn't that work? Well, because we are programmed from our ancestors. We have a fear center in our brains called the amygdala. And when we are faced with big change, which for our ancestors was usually life-threatening, a big change, we, we respond with it, it, the details. I probably can't give you all of them, but they're, they're more complicated than they need to be. But the basic fact is when faced with large change, even when it's self-induced, we tend to fail. We're programmed to fail. So when I was writing a book, I said, well, what can I tell people about change? And I, and, uh, I read about how in Japan, they have a method for organizational and personal change called Kaizen. And it's basically small steps. So in doing small steps, this part of your brain never fires, and you're more likely to achieve it. Let me give you an example, okay? So I had a patient, Tony. Tony was overweight, sedentary, pre-diabetic, hypertensive, took a lot of meds, and so he was a heart attack ready to happen. And I was not able to achieve much success with Tony. He'd make a, a resolution to do more, and he would do it a little bit, and then he would recidivate like all of us. So I said, after reading this, I said, Tony, when I see you next week, between this time and then, I want you to stand during TV commercials. He was very sedentary watching a lot of TV. He says, that's it? I said, yeah, that's it. Just stand during TV commercials. So he comes back to me the next week, and he's got a swagger. I did it, Doc. Well, that's great, Tony. How do you feel? I feel pretty good. I was able to do, do something that I said I would do. Well, now I said, let's have you walk in place. So, okay. He did that. 
So over a year's time, it's very small steps, 55 pound weight loss, off all meds, no longer pre-diabetic. What did he do? He decided that he was going to be a little more active, you know, start to, and he, he had heard my spiel, learning a little, few things, make sure that he stays socially connected and have purpose, but he did it in small steps, physically and literally in small steps. After walking in place, the next one was to go out and take 50 steps more a day, go outside and take 50 steps. That was it for a week. So what happens is the sphere center doesn't go off, but we, we start to get very confident and feel very competent. And you know what? The change that we, that we make is durable. You can all lose 50 pounds if you only eat bark, you know? But that's not life sustainable, you know? So these are sustainable. When you make this change, it is durable. You do it in small steps. Realize that we Americans don't value that. You're not gonna, you're not gonna go up somewhere in a restaurant and say, I took 20 more steps today. No, it's, but you, you, it's a gradual process that, it, that works. In fact, you cannot fail. Tony would come back and say, Doc, I didn't do what we agreed to. I said, well, Tony, we just made an error. We just went too far. Let's just ratchet it back a little bit. Okay. And we're on our way again. So honestly, if you really understand this, you cannot fail. You just have to be willing to be patient. So now let's talk about the tentatives. <laughs> Your grandmother's pro told you this. You know this intuitively. You know, we've seen it very often, uh, but some, we, just, we tend to forget. So, you know, like you saw, life throws you curveballs. I don't think people, some do, but most don't, intentionally say, well, I'm not gonna be active anymore. I'm not gonna learn anything anymore. You know, I don't want any meaning and purpose. We don't do that, but what happens is life happens. Okay, here comes another story. So when I was in college, I was chasing after a folk singer, long blonde hair, and I would follow her anywhere, and I did off a cliff in a, on a toboggan. I really messed up my leg. I had to drop out of college, lots of surgery, and so when it was all over, it was together. And so for 40 years, I was pretty good. I was military career and athlete. And then things started to happen. I started my knee and ankle started to hurt because it wasn't quite right. So I was able to get the knee fixed. How many of you have a, a new knee? <laughs> but the ankle was a problem. So I was starting to feel pretty badly about this. So I, I stopped. Uh, being active because it hurt. And then when I tried to be active, it hurt earlier. And so I ended up not doing much in the way of physical activity. Um, I, I was kind of depressed. I said, this isn't me. This isn't who I am. This isn't me of this impaired person. And we, were all, we all go through that. And so I wasn't as social. Uh, even my mind wasn't good. When I gave one of these talks, I was struggling for a word where I didn't before. I still can't use the technology, but you know that's a, that's another thing. So, and and I was circling the drain. Well, um, I'm, I'm married to an Irish woman, and she uh, got me motivated to keep looking for uh, something for the ankle. And I found a surgeon just north of me in Boston, and he repaired the ankles for the Celtics. And he he had done 199 ankle replacements, and I was 200. So now I'm feeling great after the rehab and everything. Wow, I got a future. I can do more and I'm feeling I'm doing more and I go the other way. So it's about when life throws you a curveball, be in a place, we'll talk about this, where indeed you can accommodate. Use the things and don't just say, well, that's the end of that. And also you can accommodate things and realize that not using something is, uh, is fraught with bad news. It's, we talked in aviation and I talked, you know, in the space program, you remember those first few space shots when we had Apollo? And when a, on a couple missions, when they came back, they had to carry the astronaut out of the, the module in, in a stretcher. You remember that? Yeah. These were America's finest, trained forever. And in two weeks or something, they had to be carried off. That's this. In, in weightlessness, you know, we don't use our muscles. Our heart is a muscle. It takes a vacation. And so our body was just basically sedentary, very sedentary in, in zero gravity. And they lost 
with, they could lose up to 30% of their muscle strength. They're not only their strength, but their, their muscle mass on longer missions. So we know that now, we have working on machines, but that's what happens to us down here uh, as we become more, more sedentary. So use it or lose it. Moving, we've talked about this. We've talked about sitting is the new smoking. You know, but it, it's about a lifestyle of movement. Tony started parking further, taking a few stairs. When he walked talked on the telephone, he would circle. He just, it's not, it's nothing huge and you didn't have to win medals or anything. And, and, and you know, you don't even have to belong to a fitness center. Those of you who live here, you get a great thing, but because the fitness industry has kind of made it um, either, either you're, you're a winner or you're a loser. And most of us try something, and then it's too much, and we don't do it at all. But it's just about moving. I had a CEO friend, big, big company, Fortune 500 company. And uh, he's, he said, I called in my VPs, and I said, you all have new parking spots a mile from the door. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah, two miles a day they had to walk. What happened? First, they, they complained. <laughs> Secondly, they began to feel better. He looked at the data, they were much more productive. All the people under them, they started sharing it as if they were an evangelist and a guru. You gotta be moving and made, made uh, changes. So that the whole company changed its culture based upon that one decision to move the parking spots. And so moving, moving is, is associated, not moving by the way, is associated with $53 billion in healthcare costs. Not from heart disease or all. This is from sedentary lifestyle and all the things that can happen from sedentary lifestyle. Never too late. Accommodate. When something happens, accommodate. Keep moving. Whatever you can do. Even in a chair, there's isometrics. There's you know, chair yoga. There's so many things you can do physically and also the others. Now what about that? The mind, the brain. Nola here, by the way, she was from Kansas. Anyone ever hear the story of Nola Oaks? Anyway, she was the oldest person to get an undergraduate degree uh, at 95. Because she knew something that I did not learn and physicians didn't learn when we were in medical school. We felt that the brain was pretty much like that first curve. Because up there it's best and then all you did is lose neurons and ability until you became senile. It was not a pretty picture, but now what we know is that there is this, this feature of our brains, a lifelong feature called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity. And just as the name implies, it's the ability for us to rewire our brains at any age in response to injury, disease, uh, or anything we ask it to do. Neuroplasticity. We're the architects of our own brains, ladies and gentlemen. We can look at brain scans. You start to, after spinning in the tube. Then you start to, uh, say, do woodwork or learn Chinese. And we look at your brain over time, and it's getting thicker and thicker and thicker in the areas associated with learning his new skill. He is growing new pathways, new associations in the brain. And that happens. That's a lifelong ability. Before, we always thought all that happened is the brain shrank and we lost ability. That will happen if we don't use our brains. Now, what does it take? It doesn't take, you know, you don't have to learn Chinese. You learn, learn something new. This is what challenges the brain. This is what starts to make the new connections. And the more you do it, the thicker the connections get. Learn new things. Now, in order to do that, you have to be fairly physical in order to get blood up to your brain. So that's what a lot of what the positive effect of moving is. Getting blood to the brain, learning new things, you change your brain. And make it much less likely that you will ever experience the symptoms of dementia. There was a nun study where they tracked nuns because they were living a long time, almost like the blue zone. What's going on here? So they tracked it, and what they found in those nuns is that many of them at autopsy had Alzheimer brains. Tangled nerves, plaques but they had no symptoms. What's going on here? The researchers were scratching their head for the longest time, but now we know that a lifestyle, for whatever reasons, if it's putting a gene to sleep, or, but that wasn't the case because they were actually, their brains were Alzheimer brains, but not, they didn't have the symptoms. So lifestyle can 
the conclusion is can push off the onset of things that are happening even in your brain. So as with these nuns, you may never notice it. It doesn't happen with everyone, but it's possible, and we see it. All right. She got a master's degree. Can, can you recognize that university? I think that's a Kansas university. Yeah? Well, she passed. I think she was about 106 or something when she passed. She's an icon. We've talked about connection, how it is in our very DNA that we need to be connected to others in a subjective way. Long-term studies, Tecumseh and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, Tecumseh and Alameda, uh, those who are not connected two to five times more likely to be plagued with dementia, heart disease, cancer, all the big players, just relative to connection. Not being connected is the, is the equivalent of another. It's another half pack of uh, cigarettes a day, smoking. We are meant to be together. We are better together. Now I know, I know, people are annoying. <laughs> and yes, people have hurt you. And you're not going to be hurt again. We develop defense mechanisms. And you know, we do that. We all do that. But it's not working for us. We need our alone time. I totally get it. I'm one of those. I need a lot of it. But we need each other even more. Another story. My friend Tom was a, was a fighter pilot in Vietnam. He was shot down. He was captured. He was a prisoner for seven and a half years. He was one of the longer ones. He was in solitary confinement for a good part of that, and he was tortured at least three to four times a week. He told me, believe it or not, he told me, he says, when they came to get me in solitary confinement to torture me, I felt good about it. The pain I felt from the torture was not as bad as the, the, the pain of being in solitary. We are social creatures. We are meant to be with In fact, the penal system is doing away with solitary confinement. So what's with all of this, not you guys, because you made the decision, but all your neighbors and others in this country who are, who are self-imposing solitary confinement, either as a couple or as an individual. It's destructive. It does not work. Very destructive. It, 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 we are meant to be together. I was in the Soviet Union on a tour once, and we the toured it was when it was the Soviet Union, the big apartment buildings that Stalin built. And as you walked down the court, you could hear pans and animals and people yelling and televisions and everything. And I said to the guy, how can anyone live like that? And she said, the winters in Russia are extremely long, and hearing a human voice on the other side of the wall is very comforting. <laughs> it's who we are, ladies and gentlemen. You can fight it, and yes, you've been hurt, but you're going to hurt yourself a lot more by not being connected. So Stamatis Moretis here was a Greek freedom, freedom fighter in World War II. He was injured, sent to the United States to heal. He healed, uh, he was allowed to stay, and he married, had a career, he had kids, and then he was diagnosed with lung cancer around age 69. And his doctor said, it's the matter, you're not going to live a year. He said, okay, I think funerals are cheaper in Greece, so I'm going to go back to my island in Greece where I was born. Hadn't been back since he was a kid. And he got into bed and he was waiting to die. Nothing happened. So he went, like a good Greek man, he went down to the taverna. And who is there but all of his childhood friends? They whoop it up and have a grand old time. And they start to do this regularly. And he's feeling pretty good. So he plants a vine, a vigor, and he starts to work in his friend's uh, uh, olive grove. And last, well, he passed at 106. But this was at 102. So he said, oh, it's the wine. I drink it with my friends. And, and there, there it is. Someone said, oh. What does your doctor think about all this? He says, I don't know. He's dead. <laughs> Good friend of mine gave me this quote. It's his. <laughs> That's how we know we can now do something about is risky. It's ignoring the risk. It's putting your head in the sand. So my father had colon cancer. And I, so I'm at higher risk of having colon cancer. So. Every five years, when they chase me with a six-foot snake, I let them catch me. Because you know what I can say? I will more. And 
so as long as I do my part and pay attention to the risk, even if I get it, and I could, uh, I have a good chance of treating it at least having a normal life and, and not dying of that. So uh, to ignore your risks is uh, foolish. However, the other side of the coin is that risk can make us not want to do anything. And you can't grow. I mean, life living is, has risks involved. And you can't grow. If, unless you do this. And, and here's another one. <laughs> Don't let anyone else put you at risk. You know those family members who love you so much? They want to make you bubble people. They want to keep you safe. They want to make sure you don't get hurt. And society is that, you know, age gracefully. You're over here on the side, uh, marginalized in society. Here, let's go back one. And, and, uh, and so don't do those things. There's such a thing as the dignity of risk, right? You know, and this is why you made a great decision. Some of your peers maybe made the decision to live with their children. You know, on the surface, it seems like it maybe is good. Grandkids there, no, no. It, in general, it, for the most part, it is not. Because you stay a parent, you stay a bubble person. They are helicopter kids hovering all the time. And so it's not good because in order to achieve healthy longevity, you need to continue to grow, however slowly, whatever, to continue to grow physically, intellectually, uh, socially, spiritually, with purpose. So here's the next one. Never act your age. Because if you do, society predicts, if you act your age, that this is what happens, you know, you get the decline. That's what they expect. That's what they expect this old age is about. So you're buying into that stereotype that aging is only about decline. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a Pollyanna. There is decline there, but we can limit that. We can accommodate that. We can continue to grow in other areas. Look at Stephen Hawking. I mean, he could only move his lips, and he gave more contributions to our understanding of the universe than anyone before him, even Galileo. So it's about not accepting the stereotype that's out there that aging is only about decline. Uh, I'll tell them the Chuck Yeager story. So I was, uh, I was very fortunate to meet Chuck Yeager in my Air Force career. So he came into my office at the flight test center at Edwards, and he needed a physical. He was flying for defense contractors. He was out of the military. He was late 50s. And it was great. He, he was healthy. And he just started telling me about his life. And I said, oh, geez, wow. First man to break the sound barrier. And so then he got quiet. And he says, you know, Doc, talking about this, I think on the 50th anniversary of breaking the sound barrier, I'm going to do it again. You know what I did? I was a whippersnapper physician, thought I knew everything. I said, but Chuck, you'll be 73 years old then. He looked at me, bore into me, and he said, what's your point? <laughs> what was my point? A number was determining ability? Oh, there's a lot of that going on. But no, you're absolutely right. How can we do that? We're all individuals, first of all. And secondly, we know we can continue to grow. So he did it on the 55th, the 60th, and the 65th before he passed, uh, what, a year or so ago. What a guy. Lola did it. She didn't buy into the, who would have told her, oh yeah, older adults sitting in their 90s are getting degrees all the time and getting master's degrees at 98. Yeah, sure. The greatest danger is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, it's that it's too low and we achieve it. There's studies done on this that to the extent we, we expect little of ourselves, we're probably going to reach our goal. And to the extent we expect more of ourselves, we're more likely to get there. Maybe not all the way, but at least to continue to grow. Ellen Langer is a, a researcher at Harvard who does this great work. This one's about stress. I already alluded to it. Our ancestors did not experience stress. I mean, it was, I mean, it was. You walk down, there's a lion. That's stress. You know, you either fight or you flee. And you either make it or you don't. A friend of mine wrote a book called, Why Don't Zebras Get Ulcers? Because a zebra is out there grazing, here comes a lion, chases it, and if the zebra gets away, in a few minutes out there grazing. 
what happens to you, or what do you think would happen to you, if, say, someone tried to mug you or something? You would carry that around in a backpack for the rest of your life, stressing you out when you thought about it. We, our thoughts drive our emotions as if something is really happening. So if you think about some catastrophic thing, politics, Ukraine, your finances, your to-do list, the grandkids, whatever, the bad things you're thinking about drive emotions as if it's really happening in you, and it's ripping you up, it's rotting you inside. And we're not meant to live with this kind of stress. I can't get rid of it, but we can compensate for it. We can, we can break this, this uh, it's momentum of stress in our lives that is extremely destructive with us. And the start is right there. Wherever we are, be there. Instead of having your mind running, or running like laughs around in your head about your to-do list and how bad the world is and how, you know, what, a, what an SOB that guy is or, or you know, what's going to happen to my, my finances. You know, you, you, you take those things on, but you don't carry them around with you all the time. Eric, Eckhart Tolle wrote a book uh, called The Power of Now. And he says, when faced with a stressful situation, there's only three things to do. Fix it. That's doing something. That's running, like from the lion. Or making a plan to fix it. That's also doing something. Okay? Walk away from it if it's not your problem. You know, we worry about things in the world, and it doesn't make us better citizens that we worry about it. And, and uh, we carry it around all the time. And we have no effect. We have absolutely no way to affect the outcome. That's walking away. And the third one is the one most of us have to do all the time. We accept it. It's reality. I can't change it, and it's, uh, you know, I don't, I don't prove of it, I don't think it, but, you know, I can't do anything about it. And so, you, why make a living hell within you that is, that is taking away the quality of your life, and those around you, really, and probably the quantity of your life, by, with, with this? The Greeks knew it a long time ago. Men understood, not by actual things, but by the view they take of it. Eckhart Tolle in his book said, 99% of stress is self-induced. Self-induced. There are stressful situations out there, but how you respond to it is the stress. If you accept it, or you walk away from it because it's not yours, or you fix it or make a plan to fix it, okay, then, you're, then that's handling it. And therefore, you don't carry it around with you all this time. Stress is responsible for about 80% of our medical visits are involved with stress in some way. That's the latest data. So, a little optimistic. May not be the party you hope for, but let's dance, all right? <laughs> Next is finding your purpose. You always had a purpose, right? You, uh, in your life, there was career, family, kids, and uh, you, uh, did all, you did it all. That's what you're here. There are people who think that once you do all that, well, you don't need a goal or purpose anymore. Well, you do. We wither without purpose. Without purpose, our life doesn't have meaning. Without purpose, we have no reason to get out of bed. And, and purpose is something that changes with time. It changes with where we are. Uh, I, I mentioned all the other things of when we were younger. But what's your purpose now? Now you have the freedom choose what is meaningful and what you want your purpose to be. And only you can do it. No one can tell you what your purpose should be. It's you. What will get you out of bed in the morning? What will make you feel worthwhile, that your life has meaning? We must find that. It could be raising roses somewhere for beauty. It could be doing something grandiose, trying to wipe out landmines in the world or whatever, something big. But it, we need to be able to define that, realize it changes with, it, with where we are in our lives. Because again, without it, we, we, we have no purpose. And Mary Oliver states this very, what is, is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? You're still living. And now with longevity and paying attention to your lifestyle, it's going to be very quality years. And it's, it's when you're free to choose what is meaningful to you and how you're going to spend your time. So Alfie Day is the oldest guy in Australia. He gets up every day to knit sweaters for penguins. 
Penguins have been subjected to oil spills. They preen their feathers, ingest the oil, and they die. But not when they're wearing one of his fine sweaters. That's what he does. And look at him. Oldest man in Australia, 109. We were talking about this today with uh, Wichita State and a number of the very fine professionals you have in-house here and around Wichita, around here, about intergenerational uh, programming and getting the generations back together. And I say getting them back together because, again, for 99% of the time we, we lived on Earth, we were a group, small groups, and children had a role, older adults, and they missed. And older adults had a particular role, and we see it in the, the blue zones. You go to Okinawa, that's a blue zone. You ask an older adult, how old are you? They'll lie to you. You ask anyone over 40, they'll lie to you and tell you they're older. Because to be an, an elder in Okinawa is to be needed, revered, where you're an essential part of the society. Essential. They need you. There's a word, ikigai, which is about purpose and giving back. Now, the other side of the coin is that the society is hungry for it. So they welcome it, they expect it, they want it. That's how their society works. That's the way we used to work. So getting generations back together is one of the steps towards that same sort of relationship. Especially when these kids are so good looking, right? <laughs> the two in the middle are in college now, though. <laughs> They're my grandchildren. <laughs> laughing. Laughing, having a positive attitude is critical. You know that the half full kind of people half full, they live seven and a half years longer than the half empty people. And it's quality of life by definition, because they're positive. They see the positive. Even in COVID, if you dig deep, you'll see some good things happen, despite all the tragedy. Some good things. For me, I was on a treadmill of travel. I was hardly ever home. And it stopped that dead. And I said, whoa, this is pretty nice. But then I missed all of you, and now I want to do it, but not at the rate I was doing it before. And so if, to the extent that you look for the good in almost anything, you're going to be healthier. We know good things happen in the brain. So Norman Cousins, anyone know that story? Norman Cousins wrote a book, uh, The Anatomy of an Illness in the 70s. And basically, he was diagnosed with a terminal disease. And the doctor said, maybe a year or so. And he was bummed out by that. And he said, I need to feel better, and I always feel better when I laugh. So he discharged himself from the hospital. He went and got a movie camera back in the 70s. He got candid camera episodes and Marx Brothers movies, which he liked. Brought it back to the hospital and started to laugh and laugh. And he laughed himself into remission for 30 years. He died of something else. Positive attitude. And the other thing, I think that you, you live longer because you, you're in a track, you draw people. You draw people to you. I didn't say this during the social part, the social connection part, but if you want to be a social rock star, you want to have a positive attitude and draw people to you, here's a couple of points. Some are harder than others. Forgive. Forgive. Forgive people who, you, who've been annoying or transgressed against you, and you're better off for the forgiving. You get more benefit than the forgiven people, the forgiver. There's the stress and the, and the, and the half-empty view of the world. Have compassion. Like, like my astronaut friends, we're all down here together, just trying to get through the night, and you know, some of us do it a funny way and annoy, like I said, but you know, just have compassion. That we're all just trying to do the best we can, even the most heinous among us still think they're doing the right thing. But, and here's the hard one. Are you ready? Give up the need to be right. <laughs> one lady asked me when I said that, she says, what if you are right? <laughs> so much division in the world, and we have mindsets that, that you know, mindset is basically a closed view of the world. Closed mindset. Uh, uh, fixed mindsets, we call them. And this limits your ability to connect with others, limits your ability to continue to grow. 
And uh, have you, has anyone here ever convinced someone of their side of the argument? In an argument? I mean, look at that. What are we, nuts doing this? Why waste the time? Listen to someone. Okay, listen. Learn this phrase. You could be right. You're not saying they are right. You know, you know damn well they're not right. <laughs> but you're just open to it. And you listen. That draws people together. That's not going to divide you. And you, know, you, I think you'll all admit we're at a we're at a, we're breaking records for division. I haven't seen it since the Vietnam era. It's pretty disturbing. So why have it in people who are even closer in your life? So laughing. All right. There are the ten, and uh, I'm going to give you some last minute things before I close. If the all right. Don't be on the fence about this. <laughs> Those of you who saw Star Wars, Yoda, the wise 800-year-old man, said, there is no try. There's do or don't do. Please, do. <laughs> Make a decision, because I hope I have convinced you that this is up to you, and you are empowered right this minute to make a difference in your lives. Make Make your own course here, as you can. It's really up to you, no matter where you are. Don't be like this one. <laughs> right? Remember that. And we know what happened to them, right? George Eliot, Marianne, uh, it's never too late to become what you might have been. Maybe you wanted to swim the English Channel and you won't be able to do that, but you can do it one lap at a time, say, in a pool. Accommodate. You know, it's never too late to become what you might have been, but realize also you are enough now. You don't have to be uh, dissatisfied, but you're, you're enough now, and what you need to do is just continue to grow. Don't stop growing. It doesn't matter at what pace. And where you live does matter. And you have made a decision that I can tell you, I have been all over the country, parts of the world, have been in so many senior living communities. And I can tell you, it's not because Mike's my friend, Jeff's my friend, and I've met some nice people today. But you're at the top of the heap. You're at the, probably the best, the top 3% of what's happening in a senior living community. And I beg you to take it full advantage of that. You're making it yourself, but take advantage of what's happening around you and continue to grow. Stay connected, active, fulfilled active both physically and mentally, and continue to grow. That's the key. Um, there's a Tibet project. Chuck, do you mind if I tell them a story that you've probably heard a few times about the Volkswagen? So, okay, here's a moral story. So I'm an intern, way a long time ago, and I'm up in Maine Medical Center, that's where I did my internship, and I'm in the emergency room. Uh, we're working 12-hour shifts, 7 at night to 7 in the morning. Snowstorm. Blizzard, over two feet of snow. We're very busy, and when I'm done, I go out to my car, and there it is, covered with snow, of course. So I get out the shovel, and there I am, for about an hour, shoveling out my Volkswagen Beetle. Right? Everyone had one, right? Did the locks never freeze on you? You'd think the Germans better technology. Well, I can't get in the car. I shovel out the car, and, and the lock is frozen. So I go in the emergency room and I get a hot towel and I put under really hot water and I rush out. No. Yep. Three times, no. Ah, I get a Bunsen burner. <laughs> so I go out there and I light that, trying to heat up the lock. The wind is howling and blows out the flame. I can't get it out. So then I say, you know what? I have with me at all times a source of warm fluid. <laughs> We all get it? Yeah. All right, so picture, no, don't picture this. No. I'm defrosting the lock, and a voice behind me says, what are you doing in my car? <laughs> Everyone had a Volkswagen. Right next to mine, same color, same color, <laughs> So the moral is, let's not try to come up with solutions before we know what the problem is. 
problem in many respects is us, how we view our, our older adulthood, because society has told us that there's a stereotype that you don't continue to grow. Well, now I know you have to know, you do. And it's really up to you what your trajectory is going to be. So we can do this, right? I know you can do it here. Thank you. I'll be here. Thank you.